Good afternoon, everyone. I'll go ahead and uh, I know we still have some people logging in, uh, but in the interest of time, I'll go ahead and get started as people are logging in. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Esther Peters. I am the Associate Director for the Center for East European and Russian Eurasian Studies at the University of Chicago. And I am excited to welcome everyone to this afternoon's series of voices uh, with Katarzyna Tuchkova and Veronik uh, Virkusny. Series of Voices is an author-centered series of readings and conversations on books from or about Central and Eastern Europe, Russia, Central Asia, and the Caucasus. Our long-term partner for this series is the Seminary Co-op Bookstores, the first not-for-profit bookstores whose mission is bookselling. And although their stores remain closed to the public, they are fulfilling orders and supporting sales for virtual events like this one through their website, uh, semcoop.com. When you place your order, you can choose from shipping, delivery to local area codes or curbside pickup. Uh, in addition to our partner seminary co-op bookstores, I also want to thank uh, 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 the Consulate General of the Czech Republic in Chicago for their help in organizing this event and for their continued support uh, of Czech language studies at the University of Chicago. And finally, a special thanks to Otto and Ray Chapek for supporting Czech cultural events at the University of Chicago. You can find more events about upcoming events in this series and other events uh, at our websites, series.uchicago.edu and semcoop.com, and those you will find those in the chat box below. Uh, the af this afternoon's event is the first of the spring quarter uh, for series and series of voices, and we have several more events coming up in the coming weeks and months. Of particular interest to this audience might be our May 6th event with Chad Bryant, who will be discussing his forthcoming book, Frog, Belonging in the Modern City with Tara Zara. Um, uh, today, uh, as I said, we are excited to welcome both Katarzyna Tuchkova and Veronik Verkusi. Uh, Katarzyna Tuchkova is a Czech author, playwright, publicist, art historian, and curator of exhibitions. She has won several literary awards, including the Magne Magnesia Litera Award and the Czech Bestseller Award. In 2017, she was awarded the Freedom, Democracy, and Human Rights Award by the Institute for the Study of Totalitarian Regimes. She has also received the Premio Libro de Europa at the Book Fair in Salerno, Italy, and her books have been translated into 16 languages. Uh, you'll see uh, where you can find more information not only about her other books, but uh, also, the link to uh, purchase the book, uh, the translation of Gerta, which will be the main focus of today's event at the seminary co-op. Uh, born in Bern, Switzerland, to Czech parents, Rudolf and Tatiana Ferkusny, Veronik Ferkusny grew up trilingual in Czech, English, and French. Passionate about literature, languages, and music, she devotes time to projects in all three areas. Verkutny has worked on a number of literary translations from Czech to English, including works by Michal Aves, Daniel Fischorova, Daniel Hozrova, and of course, of course, Katarzyna Tuchkova. Her most recent published English translations include Gerta and Daniela Hodrova's novel, A Kingdom of Souls, uh, with Elena Sokol. Uh, forthcoming publications include Hodrova's complete trilogy, Prague City of Torment, uh, and in addition to her work as a freelance translator from Czech, French, Italian, and German, she also coaches opera singers in Czech diction. She serves as executive director for, of the Avery Fisher Art Program of the Lincoln Center, a program established by the late Avery Fisher, which offers recognition and professional assistance to talented instrumentalists and chamber ensembles in the forms of Avery Fisher Career Grants and the Avery Fisher Prize a graduate of Barnard College where she received a BA in Italian literature and she resides in New York City. And today they will be joined in conversation by Cheryl Stevenson. Cheryl brings together theoretical and historical perspectives in her work on Central and Eastern European culture and media. Her courses at the University of Chicago focus on Czech and Russian language and literature, film and animation and the history of pop culture. Uh, two last notes before I turn things over to all of our speakers. Uh, we will be giving away up to 10 copies of, of the novel Goethe. 
Uh, if you're interested in being uh, eligible for one of these copies, please introduce yourself in the chat box. You'll see it at the bottom. Let us know who you are and, and that you would be interested in being uh, eligible for our, our giveaway. Uh, also, there will be time for question and answers at the end. Also at the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A box. Uh, please, at any time during the event, you can enter a question there uh, and uh, that we can use to ask. Also, if you see a question that you really like and are interested, you can upvote, hit the thumbs up uh, to let us know that you are particularly interested in, in hearing someone answer that question. Uh, and with that, I want to welcome Katarzyna, Veronik, and Cheryl to the conversation. Uh, and I believe we're going to start with a reading of the prologue uh, before we get into the of the novel Gerta, and then we'll we'll move on to our uh, main conversation. So, with that, uh, Veronik, do you want to uh, come back in and, and maybe start with our reading? Hello, everyone. Um, Gerta prologue. The edges of the rough road crumble into the ditch. Grass grows through the gravel and the wheels of the baby carriage bump over the stones. Her left foot has just slipped on the loose pebbles. There's a dull throbbing in her ankle. Perhaps she's pulled a tendon. She tries to avoid putting her full weight on the foot. For several hours now, they've been walking slowly, shuffling along, their baby carriages side by side. From time to time, they steady each other, take turns pushing. For a long while, it's been impossible to make out the road clearly. Only every so often do the beams of a flashlight or the headlights of a truck sweep over them, but then they huddle even tighter, hasten their steps, and throw their coats over the carriages to cover the children. She can't tell for certain how long they've been walking. It seems as though their journey has taken ages, and yet dawn hasn't even broken, so it can't have been more than a few hours. She's tired and so is her companion. Should she try to stop and rest? A few times they have passed people sitting either on the ground or on the suitcases they've been dragging along. Several times they've also seen one of the armed youths rush over and bash in these people's heads with the butt of a rifle. She was scared to stop. In spite of the stitch in her side and the pain in her left foot, she forced herself to keep taking steps. The young mother walking beside her was whispering about being thirsty. Gerta said nothing. She had hidden away some water for herself and her child, but she couldn't offer any, not knowing what still lay ahead. Although she too was thirsty, she remained silent and shuffled along, step by step, only God knew to where. God, she had lost faith in him long ago. Once upon a time, she had prayed to him, begged him to help her to do something, anything that would have changed her life. Then, little by little, she realized that God wasn't about to do a thing for her. But by then, it was too late. From that moment on, she had stopped praying and didn't think about God anymore. She wanted to be self-sufficient, even at times like this, because God had no idea where they were driving her. Only those crazed schoolboys knew, and maybe in the end, not even they. Those harebrained brats, she choked with rage. Their voices would reach her and then disappear again, becoming lost in the cries of the people ahead of her. A few times she caught a glimpse of them, riding in the backs of passing trucks. With their upraised, tangled weapons, they reminded her of Medusa and her twisted hair of snakes. A seething, raging Medusa, a murderess with the sinister, drunken maw of vulgar riffraff. Look upon them, and you would die. You would turn to stone, or they would shoot you. She hated them, but that was all she could do. Only hate, and above all, not let it show if she wanted to survive. She walked meekly beside her companion and kept her mouth shut. The night was inching toward a gray morning and ahead of her stretched a column of quiet, exhausted people. The sound of their steps, the swish of winter coats, and words uttered in low voices were interrupted only by the shouts of the guards, the moans of the wounded, and occasional gunshots. How many? Goethe could no longer keep count. 
Where exactly had this nightmare started? By the time the flowers had fallen to the bottom of her mother's open grave, everyone was already sensing it, as if they already knew. Even her father was getting anxious, although he still blindly believed. When Gerta shot him a sidelong glance, she saw how he was holding himself together, how he was clenching all the muscles in his face, keeping his eyes fixed and then hiding them behind a profusion of blinking, how hard he was trying not to cry. But he should cry, thought Gerta, he should. He should smear the top of his bald head from which the last wisps of fair hair were receding with the earth from her mother's grave. He should rub the earth onto his face, let it mix with his tears and above all, cry for forgiveness. That he should do. Not stand there preening in his uniform like a pigeon on a perch with his chest puffed out, watching her mother's coffin disappear under clods of earth. Stop, Gerta wanted to cry out, but Friedrich held her back. He grabbed her arm so abruptly it startled her. Was Friedrich not crying either? But of course, how could he? Faithful image of his father that he was. Gerta looked again into the deep hole, where by now the dark gray of the coffin was showing through only in spots. It had been a modest funeral. But this, after all, was not where it had started. This funeral was just one link in a chain of calamities that had come month by month, year after year, all through the war. And yet the life ahead of her had once seemed so full of promise. And not just her life, Friedrich's too, and her father's and her mother's and Janinka's and Karel's, all of their lives had been meaningful and had made sense. They had all been moving as a unified whole toward a future, the contours of which Goethe could make out perfectly. Yet by the winter of 1942, when mother disappeared beneath the Schneer headstone, that vision of the future was already disintegrating. The last semblance of security would be trampled by the mob on the feast of Corpus Christi in 1945. But first, a whole series of other events was still to come. Hello everyone, and thanks so much to Veronique there. Um, so if we're ready, shall we begin a Q&A with questions? <laughs> so um, I do have questions prepared for Katarzyna and for Veronique and for everyone else. Um, but there will be time at the end, so you can use that Q&A box um, and we'll come to those in about 30 minutes or so. Um, I would like to thank, start by thanking both of you um, for the fact that we have this book and that now we have it in English, um, both for us as a kind of community of readers, but especially for those of us who teach um, Central European history and culture. It is so challenging finding ways of teaching the, the kind of complexities of ideas about perpetrators and collaborators and collective guilt and retributive justice and these things without really powerful individual narratives. These are kinds of the places where the, the broad geopolitical approach to understanding history fails. Um, and I think this text does really important work in addressing that failure and providing us with a really compelling individual narrative um, that we can all bring into the classrooms to really help students um, see a new understanding of this part of the world and to generally get a sense of the complexity. We kind of, we talk continually about the kind of crossroads <laughs> of this part of the world. Um, and I think this text does really excellent work in both letting us see and letting us feel um, the, the kind of complexities of this time period. So thank you to you both <laughs> for this. Um, I'll start with a question that addresses the very beginning, perhaps, the kind of origins of this text. Um, so Katarzyna, I've read um, about connections both between you kind of living in Brno and a kind of formerly German part of Brno, and also in doing work to research for the book of kind of recreating the actual march to Pohorzelica. Um, so I'm wondering if you can talk about your personal experience um, and the experience of starting to write and writing Gerta. 
Okay. Hello, everybody. At first, I would like to say you hello and uh, thank you for inviting you, uh, inviting me. Thank you for uh, Esther, Shirley, Cheryl, and Irena Chaikova that they wanted uh, me to speak about Gerta and uh, thank you that you would like to listen something about Gerta and um, relating my experiences. So it's uh, now a long uh, time ago. The book was published uh, in the year 2009 in Czech Republic and uh, I started to work um, on it three or four years uh, earlier than was this date so it's a really long time but uh, I can um, remember uh, the, the, the whole beginning very well still because uh, it's what it was uh, mm, it was uh, mm, I can tell that I was tabula rasa as uh, people of uh, my generation at the time uh, about the Czech Germans uh, problematic. Because uh, in my city, in Brno, uh, even there was uh, a lot, uh, there lived 30% um, uh, of Germans in past. No one knows at the time uh, when I studied in high school and in university about the common past of uh, free culture circles or free nation in Brno. Because the German question or German issue was, um, uh, was uh, really, can cancelled in in uh, Brno. There was no uh, real uh, trades uh, in Brno which we could see in streets. So I started uh, to um, ask people when I moved to district uh, where uh, which was quite uh, quite um, um, in uh, in quite a bad shape. And I asked why it is uh, uh, in such a condition. And the answers with which I uh, wasn't given, it was long time when I start uh, when I found down the answer, but the answer was that, uh, uh, that the condition was um, of, of district where I lived uh, is so bad because uh, in previous time Germans and uh, Jews lives there and after the Second World War all these uh, neighbors all these people were uh, transferred and um, no one uh, knows um, no one uh, and they were forgotten maybe if I can I would tell the rest in Czech and ask Veronique to help me to translate <laughs> this <laughs> this part because I found uh, words quite uh, um, uh, not easily to, uh, today here is a night so maybe I'm a bit tired so I'm very sorry for my English and I ask Veronique to help me a, bot, if, a bit if I can. Uh, Veroniko, můžu vás poprosit jenom jestli byste prosím řekla, že uh, v těch uh, 90. letech uh, nebyla otázka uh, česko-německého soužití ještě tak, uh, tak uh, zveřejňována a tak diskutována uh, ve v, kruzích normálních lidí, přestože historici se tedy o tom už bavili, ale že celá tato uh, historie byla poměrně skrytá. So uh, Katka is saying that when she first started working on this book among people, no one really was talking about this whole uh, question of German and Czech cohabitation and the fact that there were these two communities. It was something that was beginning to be dealt with a little bit among historians, but it was not a topic of interest for the general public and not something that was being really talked about at all. A na, vůbec vlastně na tu ideu ptát se, proč to místo, ve kterém žij, žiju, vlastně vypadá tak, jak vypadalo, byl nápis, německý nápis na jedné z budov, velice zašlé fasádě, na které byl nápis Mérische Glas und Spiegel Industrie a ten mě vlastně tedy přivedl k tomu, že v té čtvrti žil také kdysi někdo jiný než sousedé nebo my, my v době, kdy jsme tam žili. So the whole, the whole impetus for Katka's beginning to ask questions was that in this neighborhood where she, where she was living as a student in Brno, she saw a very faded uh, sign, signage on one of the walls in German saying, Vermischen Merische Glas und Spiegel Industry. So the Moravian glass and mirror industry essentially, and it was in German. And that's what made her start asking about, you know, why, what is this? German language ad essentially. What is it? Was it? What is it doing here? Why is it here? That was the first time she really started to ask those questions. 
because no one even talked about the fact that uh, that German was had been such a part of a, really a second language almost in Brno. Hmm. A trvalo to sice nějaký čas, ale nakonec se mi podařilo uh, najít um, um, starší lidi, kteří vlastně byli ochotní o té problematice mluvit a nebylo to úplně jednoduché, ale ve finále jsem vlastně našla i uh, ženy, které se kdysi účastnili vlastně toho odsunu um, toho brněnského pochodu smrti, jak se mu říká, který je um, tedy tématem mé knihy. So it, it took Katka quite a while, but she finally, through asking many questions, she actually started to find older people who were willing to talk about that time and then eventually even found her way to older women who had actually participated, been involved in that death march, which forms such a central part of her novel and who were willing to talk about their experiences. A vlastně z jejich vyprávění jsem se dozvěděla, že ve stejné ulici, ve stejném domě, ve kterém jsem, do kterého jsem se tehdy přistěhovala i já, žila na konci války 21-letá vlastně dívka ještě s půlročním dítětem, která pocházela z česko-německé rodiny, což bylo v minulosti pro Brno velmi symptomatické. A že i tato, nehledě na svůj věk a vůbec životní okolnosti, byla vlastně z Brna vyvedena a musela absolvovat ten asi 30-kilometrový pohod, pochod k pohořelicím. So among, among these, um, the answers that Katka was discovering, she learned also that in the same building into which she had moved, there had lived a young, young woman who was 20 at the time of a mixed German-Czech family background who had a six month old baby and that even this young woman completely without regard for her, her circumstances and her, her heritage, the Czech German mixture was very typical of Brno at the time, was forced to really leave everything and be on this march to Pohořelice, 30 kilometers through the night towards the Austrian border. Mm. A já jsem vlastně v té době byla podobného věku jako ta hrdinka, která se nejmenovala ve skutečnosti Gerta, to jméno je fiktivní, ale byla jsem tedy podobného věku jako ta dívka a připadalo mi, že je velice nespravedlivé, když pokud ona měla nést takovou, nebo nést prostě vinu za to, co nespáchala, čeho nebyla ani účastná ve svém věku a tedy okolnostech, za kterých žila a připadalo mi, že ten její příběh musím zkrátka nějak, nějak, nějak mu dát hlas, protože uh, mi přišlo, že uh, všechen ten trest, který se snesl na uh, lidi česko-německé národnosti a nebo vůbec na uh, německé populaci Brna nebyl ve všech případech spravedlivý. So at the, at the time when, when Katka discovered this, she was about the same age as this young woman and she thought it was it was just quite overwhelming to think that a young person who really had had no active participation in the events that had taken place would be forced to carry the burden of this blame and it made her question this whole idea of of really the 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 justice of putting blame on the heads of many just because they were of a German background, even when it wasn't necessarily justified. And she felt that it was very important to give a voice to, to this young woman and people like her who had been basically saddled with, with blame for something that they weren't necessarily involved in, just for the sake of, of their, their ethnic background. It seemed very unfair. Yes, so it was the starting point. Thank you very much, Veronique, for your help. I hope I was close, close enough, got the gist. Yeah, thank you both. Um, I think one of the fascinating things, especially with the translation coming now, um, is that it feels like there is a lot more attention on the kind of the Benesh degrees still being in effect and this kind of general problem of a lack of acknowledgement um, of the expulsion as a, a kind of... Um, a kind of really extreme episode that gets overshadowed by Holocaust scholarship. Um, and it's kind of just now being talked about. And we have recent events, Angela Merkel, um, I think in 2019 or so, um, got a lot of backlash for, for comments about the way that this expulsion and the violence attached to it 
wasn't justified in any way. Um, but we also have popular movements look like the, the kind of year of retribution or of reconciliation in 19 or in 2015. Um, and on top of all of that, there's been the kind of ongoing refugee crisis um, of the last years that's drawn a lot of attention to nationalism in Central Europe and the kinds of exclusion in discourses that's still maintained about Czechness, Polishness also kind of falls into a similar category. Um, and in some ways, because of all of that change, it feels like Gerta kind of changes with that. Um, the book itself is in a different position, maybe is being read by different people or being talked about in different ways. Um, so I'd love to hear perhaps from both of you um, about that kind of shifting place of this narrative as understandings of nationalism and of this kind of historical context are changing um, and have been changing since this book was published originally in Czech. Katka, do you want to go first or should uh, I? For me, it was too quick and too hard. So at first, can I ask you please for the translation into Czech? The question was <laughs> 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 Sorry. <laughs> Máte zač, jenomže politická situace moc se změní. Jo, a my víme, že Angela Merkel řekla, že ta celá situace byla jako bez důvodu i taky, že byla krize imigrace, že teďka vidíme jako mezinárodní komunita vidí, že nacionalismus v centrální Evropě je ještě problema, tak já mám smysl, že Gerta se změní jako kniha a smysl knihy se změní protože kontext se změní, jo. Mm -hmm. A já, já se zeptala, jako, co myslíte, jako je, je Gerta jako úplně jiná kniha teďka, nebo je jako stejná? Yeah, it definitely changed, that, that's true. In the time when the book was published in Czech Republic, it was the year 2009, uh, it was... Uh, uh, at the time, it wasn't completely new topic. It was new topic in 90s, but the discussion of historians and uh, professional circles, there was a debate, but the uh, white audience, uh, just ordinary people, uh, didn't um, didn't discuss the Czech-German problematic anymore. It, wasn't, it was a question of the past. But uh, if the book was uh, published, then the discussion somehow started, and uh, sometimes it was quite rude in, and, and quite problematic to be on the author's reading and discuss with people because the opinion of, um, of public was uh, quite uh, black and white. There was no shadows, uh, no one uh, remembered the uh, Germans who were, for example, social democrats who were on the Czech side or anti-fascists or uh, just ordinary people like were children, old people, mothers like was Gerta who, wasn't involved in the mm, big word problem. Um, so uh, the discussion at, at first in Czech was uh, quite um, um, hard. Uh, I had to answer the questions uh, like uh, if I'm aware what the, was the meaning of the Holocaust and how I can compare the fate of uh, uh, Czech Germans or Czechoslovakian Germans with the people who um, died or survived Holocaust. So there was a, there was a real hard time, <laughs> but slowly, very slowly, it changed. Uh, and uh, it's not it was not only because of uh, the book get out the the theater play, but uh, the other um, artists, intellectuals people um, who, who were um, uh, interested in the problematic spoke about it um, more and more and uh, people listened, mm. it's true. And uh, finally in the year 2015, yes, which was uh, six years after the publishing of the book, a uh, real big change happened in Brno, for example, in the, in the city when this, where, where, where this story is set people were so willing to uh, make something about this problematic that uh, uh, in this uh, year, it was the, also an anniversary of the, the end of the Second World War. Uh, the mayor and the city council um, decided that there will be told an apology uh, to uh, German neighbors 
or Czechoslovakian Germans living in Brno, our previous neighbors, who were um, who, who died or who were um, somehow um, uh, in, in infected by the by the by the situation uh, in the year 1945. And it was for the first time in Czech Republic when something like that apology happened. So um, it, it, it um, together with Gerta, I was uh, the witness of a real big change in this topic. Yeah, it's um, it's interesting now because we read it and think about it because the translation is like brand new right now, but it's, it's such an important, the, the time between 2009 and now is such a, a important time for this question. Um, another question, the kind of big one, because I'm in the humanities, um, why a novel? Um, and I ask this, Partly when we study um, Czech literature, we study so much the, the kind of the 1960s and the idea that truth only exists in literature is so big in the 1960s. Um, and it feels in some way, especially thinking about the situation in 2009, that Gerta kind of does almost the same thing. Like here's a place where, where truth can be in literature because it's literature. Um, so the question essentially, um, why is it important to you to do this in a novel um, that people read as fiction? Can I uh, ask you for translation yep. again for the check, please? Hlavní otázka je, proč literatura? Myslíme, že to je jako dějiny a obyčí? Um, obvykle my, č, my čteme o, o dějinám jako v akademickou práci, ale myslím, že um, v české literatuře je, je, očin, očin, je hodně, um, hodně vážný vztah mezi pravdou i literaturou, jo? ale to je pro mě, to je diskurze i z 60. let. No myslím, že Gerta má něco z toho, že jako tady najdeme pravdu v literatuře, jo? Tak, tak proč psát literaturu o dějinám? Proč jsem se třeba nerozhodla psát o tom jako historickou práci, literaturu faktu? Proč, proč tedy román, jo? No, proč román? Jako to správně? Jo. Jo. So why I decided to write it as, as a novel, not as a, as, a, as a professional history book, even I'm a historian or art historian. So it's a um it, it 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 was easy decision because uh, i uh, i sympathized very much with gerta mm -hmm. and to write or gerta it's the, it's the it's it's not real name the, the the woman who or the girl who lived in the house and uh, in the streets when, where i lived uh, has another name but when i found out her fate and fate of her half year old baby in the 1945 uh, i couldn't to write about it um, uh, professional book text. Uh, it was too emotional for me. And uh, I think that uh, it was necessary to give her her, her own voice in, in sentences, in replicas, uh, and to give into her uh, story, the story which happened uh, to give, um, to, to give um, uh, it life, um, so I couldn't do it in te in professional text. Mm -hmm. If uh, if it was answer, <laughs> so doufám, že jsem odpověděla srozumitelně, uh, jenom stručně tedy ještě v češtině. Kdybych psala uh, uh, o příběhu Gerty uh, nějaký odborný text, tak si myslím, že by to nikdy nemělo takovou, uh, jak si, takovou výpovědní hodnotu, jakou to mělo v případě románu a také jsem jako to nedokázala promýšlet jinak, než skrze uh, emoce a prožitky, uh, o kterých jsem se tedy dozvěděla z vyprávění tří pamětnic, které jsem um, vlastně zpovídala. Veroniko, can I ask you please? 
just to, to paraphrase Gatka's answer was that this was a topic that she found impossible to, she found it impossible to tell the story of this young woman, Gerta as a pseudonym, not the actual name of, of the girl who lived in the building that Gatka uh, was living in, but that it was so emotional for her that the only way in which she found it possible to tell this story was actually through the emotional, through retelling it as an emotional experience of the protagonist um, in a nutshell, I think. That's the, yeah. Do you agree? Um, a few questions that are more kind of inside the book. <laughs> um, one is that the the story of incest in this text, um, I think, is one that's really striking because we already have such a sense of trauma before we get to that. Um, so I'm curious about, um, about your understanding of kind of like what we gain when we have that, that kind of like huge second layer of trauma, and especially because the trauma of the expulsion and the march is something that, and even returning to Brno feels really collective. We have these kind of other women who it's connected to, but Gerta never tells anyone even Barbara about this connection um, and who Barbara's father is. Um, so I'm wondering both about your sense of, of the role of that incest in this text and also kind of what we get by having this very kind of private trauma and then these shared collective ones. So the just <laughs> Like Mulasem Otom Yak um Yak Friedrich Ye Otec Barbori, you know, at so to dela v Romanu, protože my už máme jako takové jako společnou traumu, jo, že ty ženy spolu um žijou, ale pro Gerty to je jako soukromá trauma, jo. A nevím, jako co myslíte o to, jak, jak to funguje v Romanu. Nebo možná, jestli bych mohla jenom, co to přidá, co, co tohle to, co, jako velice osobní trauma ještě přidá jako hmm. další vrstvu a co to dělá v tom románu. Jo. Já jsem se té um, problematice incestu vlastně tam nevěnovala, ta tam není vůbec rozvedena, ono to je v podstatě takové jako meziřádky, tak uh, vy jste to teď řekla, a <laughs> ono to je tam, pořád jsem se tak snažila, aby to bylo trošičku skryto a aby si vlastně tohoto čtenář jenom domyslel, protože to tam je opravdu v jedné jediné větě někde jako poznamenáno uh, a čtenář se to skutečně musí nějak dovodit, ale když už se ptáte, tak uh, tedy... Um, asi určitě jsem tím chtěla naznačit vývoj vlastně toho otce, který, kterého ta doba nejdříve vynesla to jeho ego vlastně úplně na vrchol a potom byl naprosto zdevastován vlastně tím pádem socia, jako těch jeho nacistických ideí a tím, čím on se identifikoval, takže byl nakonec vlastně schopen pod vlivem alkoholu a různých okolností spáchat i takový čin ale ten čin není vlastně jako směrodatný pro to, co se dělo Gertě. To je samozřejmě velká katastrofa, ale, ale ten román se vlastně věnuje něčemu jinému. I was listening so intently, I just realized halfway through that, that actually I should say this in, in English. So Katka was saying that when she originally put that detail in, it, it's, it's really indicated it's not spelled out it's almost and I have to say when I first read the novel I completely missed it I had to go back and and look for it because I it was so really between the lines that this happens um, in a way it's not central to the story which is about a much bigger drama but one of the things that that Katka felt was important was that it showed really the transformation of the character of Gerta's father whom in a sense the Nazi situation, the, the, so when, when the Germans came and occupied, that whole political context raised him up and kind of brought his ego into full bloom. And yet, ultimately, it also then drove him to the point where he was capable under the influence of just, you know, alcohol and despair of suddenly uh, becoming 
a completely um, of, of doing something so so completely animalistic and basically degenerate as this ultimate act. It was kind of the journey of his his rise and fall as a character and the power of the circumstances on an individual's fate. If I've missed anything essential, Katko, that you still want me to add, let me know. I think you told it better than me. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, and one final question, because we do have a lot of questions from the audience that I want to make sure we have time for, um, is about kind of the, the polyphony of this text. Um, so for, for quite a long time in the beginning, we are focused just on Gerta. Um, and we are so close to her that it's almost um, it's almost shocking when all of a sudden we start a chapter and realize that we're with Barbara and not with Gerta, um, kind of looking at her. Oh, this one I would love to hear from both of you because it feels like an interesting an interesting problem to deal with as a translator as well. Um, and kind of how. Um, how introducing those other voices and other perspectives that are far away from Gerta um, kind of changes changes her position um, and kind of the, what the approach is to that that polyphony in general. Ale hned díváme se Barbaru a, a čtenář neví, jako co to, co jde. <laughs> to je jako nějaké překvapení. A um, chtěla jsem zna, uh, vědět, jako, um, jak to se změní, jako, jak vidíme Gertu. Mm -hmm. Nebo jak rozumíte Gertu. Yeah. So for me was uh, very important to show that it wasn't only the, the, the problem or what happened, it wasn't not only problem of Gerta, even she was the, 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 the figure or the person who, uh, who suffered much, but still the trauma which uh, happened to her wasn't only uh, hers, uh, it, um, uh, it um, went in time to her daughter uh, Barbara and to her granddaughter Banička and uh, it's visible. And uh, I, I've heard it many times from the uh, personal witnesses or from the women who uh, were involved into the march uh, that uh, the, the things which happened to them, they were raped, they were, they were suffered a lot, they were humiliated. Uh, it was a real traumatic situation. So uh, that they couldn't to speak about it uh, through their whole lives and uh, their children didn't understand what's happened. Uh, very often they didn't tell to their, uh, didn't told, didn't tell to their children uh, even about their uh, German roots. So also the, ident the identity in the in the family or uh, between the first and second generation was missing. So the second gener generation didn't understand what's happened uh, before they were born. And um, these voices, uh, voices of the second and third generation was also very important for me. And I think that without them, the whole uh, whole story wouldn't be complete. And Veronique, was this something that that was a, a, a kind of question for you to kind of work through as a translator as well? But the the character that for me I found the most um, intriguing and challenging at the same time was Barbara's voice, mm -hmm. because I wanted um, I really felt that that her voice had to be distinct and her way of speaking was very different from her mother mm -hmm. and the way and yet and yet the other the other thing was I wanted to make sure she she didn't sound like she belonged to any particular you know American de demo, um, demograph or any particular group mm -hmm. so I was trying to make it clear that she was slightly less sophisticated and a bit childish although we see her first as a child and then of course she she grows up and um, reading aloud was very helpful mm -hmm. in in that. And um, but I and I guess when I was reading the book, I was so I was drawn in so closely that those shifts in narrator 
were very, they, they struck, they came very organically. They were very organically understandable to me. Um, I can see that if one is reading it just quickly for the first time, it probably can be a bit disorienting, the sudden shifts. Um, but I tried to, I tried to give each speaker their own distinct voice as much as possible. One of the other things that I think helped in the original was that that it had a lot more German mm -hmm. words interspersed. Um, the our our editors for the um, for the English translation were concerned about not having too many foreign words and foreign expressions in the text because they felt it would it would dissuade or throw off American readers. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, when Friedrich is speaking, or or when Fried Friedrich the father or Friedrich the brother there was a certain natural um, quality to their, their narrative in the Czech original because it was so interspersed with more German references. So you got a sense of the gruffness, their voice, their voice was very much shaped by that. And because we had to minimize that in the English, um, I think it, it made it a little bit less dramatic, those shifts in voices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I, I commend you on the fact that for me as a reader reading the translation in these last few weeks, Barbara speaks the universal language of annoyed by her mother. Oh, I'm so glad to hear you say that <laughs> in a way. <laughs> that, that is kind of a universal multi-generational voice. Um, so um, yeah, I paused at those. Um, also for those who are thinking about reading this or who haven't finished it yet, um, the kind of moments when foreign words come in are are kind of very carefully chosen in a lot of ways. Um, like I think especially the discussion of of Shalina, which is the the kind of ultimate Brno um, marker of Brno Czech in contemporary speech, which is actually how I learned about the German expulsions was from hearing the word Shalina and looking it up um, as a Czech student because I thought about the Sudetenland as something that very Northwestern um, and didn't make a connection to Brno until I learned that word. So there are kind of asides about the language that are really telling um, that give you really important cultural history. So I would love to turn our attention now to some questions from the audience, if we can. Um, there are some great questions here. I will say there are a few questions here that are more of like the historical factual kinds of questions that are fascinating ones, but we don't have kind of historians of this time period here, um, and especially ones that are asking about numbers and things. There, there are good English language resources that are easily online researchable. Um, so I'll focus more on questions directed for a translator and an author um, of this text. But please do keep adding questions if you would like to. Um, so the first question that we got is one um, for Veronique that is, Many readers think that translating is matching word for word. Um, can you explain the role of cadence, rhythm, and the meaning behind the actual words in your work as a translator, and maybe particularly with this book, or maybe more broadly? I always start with a very literal translation as the first step, and then I try to really focus on the nuance of every meaning of every of every line, and also of the the. I tried to get into the head of the character who, especially for this book, who is the narrator. And then the very last step of this translation for me was actually reading it out loud. And I, I had a very dear friend who was kind enough to be a reader who said something to me that was invaluable that directly relates to this question. And she said, read it out loud with the idea of being a conductor and see where the pauses naturally fall because I did find that there were certain sentences that worked in Czech being quite long and elaborate, but that did not work the same way in English that actually lost energy by being too long. So, so I, I did try then to make sure that as I read it aloud, that the natural rhythm served to actually energize and carry the meaning of each sentence, even if in, in certain cases it meant I had to break a sentence up into two parts, which I, I try very much to stay faithful to the original. I don't like to do that, but, but the rhythm really told me where, where the sentence 
needed to go in order, as far as I was concerned anyway, that the meaning was, was best communicated and that it kept the intensity and focus, so. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, we have another one that's, that's marked as a question um, just for the translator, but I think is one that's, that's interesting on both of your ends. Um, and that is um, what research looked like for you um, in work on this text, um, kind of what kinds of sources were valuable for you um, in your work on Gerta? Katka, I think you should go first because you started the original digging and mine was the second layer. <laughs> So for me was the most important thing that I finally, after some time, I met uh, three women who were um, who were uh, as, as children involved into the march, and uh, they opened to me. Uh, they were um, uh, willing to share with me their memories, and uh, it was the, the big surprise for me because through their eyes I saw the history which we were learned in high school and university in a really different perspective. So it was the, the, the main source which I I'm thankful, grateful until now. And then of course uh, uh, literature of the of the 30s and 40s, the newspaper, for example. And uh, then I has uh, had also. Uh, very um, kind uh, um, person who helped me. It was a historian, David Kovařík. Uh, he's my friend, and at that time he wrote his uh, dissertation thesis about the topic, about the so-called death match, and about the mass grave, which uh, is in Pohořelice, and about the history of how the mass grave was uh, built and uh, tabooed and found out again. And uh, I discussed with him a lot, and he was so nice that he um, shared with me his um, his uh, work and his uh, ideas and his uh, his research. So this was the main sources. I'm really grateful until now. And on on my end, I mean, the the internet I have to say was invaluable because it just allowed me to. I discovered things. One of the other periods of history that Gerta talks about that I knew very, very, very little about was actually in the 50s. And, you know, that whole period where suddenly the Communist Party started to turn on its own. And that, that was something that that led me to find all sorts of both, um, you know, articles and, and other research papers, documentaries that had been made. I mean, it was, it was really, I learned so much in the course of translating this novel, not only about the, the Germans and, that, and, and the very early part, but also about what happened then for so many decades thereafter. Yeah. We've got another question here from Misha Akulkova, who very generously translated it for me. <laughs> um, she was curious about female characters in Katarzyna's books, thinking about Gerta, Zhitovska Bohemia, and other books um, that are centered on women. So what significance does a women's perspective have for Czech history? What new and unique, um, what is new and unique in what we learn um, seeing early post-war Czech history through women's eyes. She says, Rada bych se dozvěděla více o ženských hrdinkách, Gerta, Žitovské bohyně a tak dále. Proč ženské hrdinky? Co je na nich zajímavého a co nového se můžeme dozvědět o české historii skrze ženské hrdinky? Um. So it's easy, the, the answer is easy. I write uh, about uh, women because I'm a woman and for me it's the, this perspective, the, the natural and I can understand a lot of things better uh, than when I would write uh, through men's eyes. And uh, I also think that there are uh, some periods episodes, stories, which uh, wasn't uh, told through women's eyes, that uh, there wasn't, uh, that, that the women hadn't enough space in uh, novels and uh, literature history uh, in past. And that's why I wanted to, um, to uh, zaplnit to fill this gap. Fill this gap. Thank you very much, Veronique. <laughs> Um, 
like I said, we do have historical questions, but with only five minutes left, um, I also don't want to trap you both talking about a project that's already finished. Um, so I would love to know what's next. Um, and especially if there's any consideration of any other works of Katarzyna's that we might see in English translation. Or about the film version of Gerta, which seems to have been an on and off rumor. Sorry, what was the first part of the question? <laughs> I remember <laughs> only from the film. <laughs> so last year on September, another book was, uh, was uh, published. It's a book about the heroines of uh, Czech past. It's a book for children. I cooperate on it with uh, Renata Fucikova, great uh, illustrator, and she's also the co-author of, co of text. You can see it here. Here, <laughs> this is the, this is the, the the book called Herdinke Heroines, and uh, now uh, nowadays I hope that I'm already finishing the the book about um, uh, about persecution of of nuns uh, during communist time because this is also the, the taboo um, taboo topic of uh, Czech uh, history or Czechoslovakian history, uh, the persecution of nuns, which happened uh, since 50s till 1989. So, another novel. Uh, the movie. So I, I, uh, it's two years ago when I read the uh, the screenplay. So it was uh, it was done, but probably because of COVID uh, or another um, another things maybe happened, it's still not uh, ready for for shooting for shooting. Uh, so we are uh, waiting, but the the Gerta will be uh, it's in very good hand in negative production and Czech television production so I hope that it will be in future uh, ready to go to cinemas. Mm -hmm. That's great. And Veronique, can we ask what's next for you or what's what's currently in the works? I'm not I haven't decided. <laughs> I, I'm just um, I'm very lucky in that really translation for me is is sort of a labor of love and so I I, I'm waiting for the next thing to come and speak to me and think, okay, I, this, this needs, I need to try to try to make this accessible for English readers. Yeah. So not yet sure. Absolutely. Um, so like I said, we do have a lot of questions in the chat that are, that are kind of more historical and asking about um, the, the kind of expulsions and conditions around those. Um, which I don't know if we're prepared to speak on, um, but might ask Katarzyna, um, kind of what, what are the next steps um, kind of in repairing um, this kind of historical pain and trauma? So my dělá jako možná jako mladí Češi o tom, co můžou dělat. Uh, what they could do with this topic, or co můžou dělat s tímhle tématem, nebo? S tímhle tématem, jako já vím, že už jsou jako um, um, March Reconciliation v Brně a takové jako akce, jako co jsou jako další kroky um, mm -hmm. s problémem, um, jako... Hojení, myslím, že chcete říct. Mm -hmm. Pro hojení. Mm -hmm. No... V tomhle případě už jsme naštěstí tedy ten velký jaksi krok ote, odě, udělali a to, že jsme celou tu problematiku s kolegy a s dalšími lidmi, kteří se o tu problematiku zajímají, otevřeli a to je asi úplně to nejdůležitější. Mluvíme o tom a dnes už o tom mluvíme tak, že vlastně ta diskuze není černobílá, jak jsem říkala na začátku. Dnes už dokážeme vidět nejrůznější příběhy, které se pod tím velkým a obtížným názvem česko-německé vztahy nebo česko-německé smíření skrývají. Veronika, can I ask you? Yes, because I see we only have one minute. Katka is saying basically the greatest service is that it is now something that is regularly talked about and is able to be talked about not strictly from a black and white perspective that now it's it's become much more open and 
people are talking about it and able to see it from different perspectives. And that's probably the most important next step that, that has been accomplished. Yeah. Well, and please congratulations and thanks to you both for being part of that process. Um, so it is three o'clock, which means that Zoom is going to magically just shut off and, um, and send everyone their own ways. I want to thank everyone for coming. Um, and thank you so much for your questions and attention. I know this format isn't the usual um, that we're used to with getting together with authors, but it's been wonderful having all of you join us. And I offer special thanks to Veronique and to Katarzyna um, for coming and joining us from afar. And to, of course, to Esther Peters for organizing this event um, and to the seminary co-op for their support of these kinds of gatherings. Um, so. If that's all the questions we have, I will thank you all. I still don't know if you were I have thank, nothing. You. thank you. Thank you for that lovely uh, wrap up, Cheryl. And thank you to Veronique and Katarzyna for joining us. And I know there was at least one question in the chat about the video, and it will be on the series YouTube channel uh, probably in the next week or so. So if you would like to rewatch or if you know anyone who would who missed it, who would like to, to catch up on this conversation, uh, that is where they can find it. So. Uh, Thank you very much. So. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.